So I'm going to invite everyone to come back to the main room um, for the last segment of our virtual program, which is a new addition to our Marshall Myers retreat um, that we've called the Advocacy Panel. And this time slot is really dedicated to um, introduce our participants, all of you guys, into some tangible steps of how to be active in advocacy work related to our topic of food justice. Um, so we have two amazing presenters. We have Jose from Bread for the World and Bob from the Interfaith Public Health Network. And they're gonna take turns kind of presenting a few um, bills and also, um, you know, just educational like ways or like equipping us with ways to engage in advocacy in our community, such as letter writing, but I'll let them kind of take over. So Jose, you're welcome to take the floor and yeah, share a little bit about the advocacy going on with Bread for the World and also how New Yorkers can be engaged as well. Sure. Um, give me a second to bring up the presentation really quick. Um, so we're not going to go through through all of these slides, um, but just uh, wanted to prepare them so people can, can be aware. Thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity. Honestly, the level of engagement and the transparency and, and honesty that we've been having in these conversations um, have been have been amazing. I've been um, shocked. I was just in the, the migrant um, um, food security uh, conversation and I, I was just surprised by all the work that's been, that we're doing. Um, one, one thing I have been hearing is, is how can we, or like, what can we do? What are some advocacy actions we can do? How can we tie this together? Um, and I just want to want to want to say that the, we're at the right place. Um, me and Bob are, are going to help out. So just a quick introduction for Bread for the World. Um, Bread for the World is a Christian advocacy organization. We're ecumenical um, and we work to end hunger both domestically and internationally through federal uh, food and uh, through federal policy that can address the, that food insecurity. Um, we have a. Um, a number of different ways of working and um, uh, the primary way we do work is um, with faith partners in the United States um, who can actually advocate on behalf of this food on behalf of the issues that they see in their communities directly to their members of Congress through offerings of letters and in district meetings. Um, and uh, we'll go through that in a second. Um, I just want to frame um, I know a lot of uh, statistics of, of, and a lot of uh, we've shared a lot of stories. Um, but a food insecurity in New York, around one in 10 people uh, face it um, across the whole state. Um, so it's a very serious issue. Um, oh, I see you taking a picture. Um, I'll be sure to, to share it afterwards. <laughs> um, we also focus on global hunger. Um, we, uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, it's unfortunate that so many people still go hungry every day. Um, but um, in, in some parts of, of, of the world, there's uh, they don't even have some uh food support networks that we do here. Um, so we are always constantly in mind and, and trying to make sure that we advocate for our uh, brothers and sisters across the globe. Um, one of the major pieces of legislation um, that has to do with food security um, is something called the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is something that's done every five years. Um, and it is a huge piece of legislation that covers around $428 billion um, in this past few years. Um, touches the, the 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 lives of every person in the United States, um, and it has to do with the USDA, how the USDA is funded, um, and also all sorts of other engagement programs and uh, agricultural development programs in, domestically and internationally. Um, you know, the, the Farm Bill by itself is 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 huge. There's a number of different titles. They're they're all here. Um, things from commodity to con conservation to international trade to nutrition, um, to research and agriculture. There, there's, there's really a large a large uh, plethora of, of things that this bill covers. Um, and um, we at Bread for the World focus primarily on nutrition, trade, uh, research, horticulture, and a, 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 a title called Food for Peace that helps, stable, that helps provide um, uh, US commodities to countries in need and helps develop capacity in these countries for local agriculture and help support their economies. Um, just here, a little um, breakdown of what the Farm Bill actually um, costs and what it, what it is. Um, uh, over uh, over 70% of the, of the budget for the Farm Bill um, actually goes into nutrition. And the, the primary program in this, in this uh, bill is, is SNAP. Um, it's a supplemental nutrition assistance program that so many people in the United States um, have access to. 
Um, one good thing that, that I do like to say is that for every $1 that goes into SNAP, $1.5 go back into the economy because SNAP doesn't only support people in need. Um, it also supports farmers. It also supports distributors and it supports retailers. Um, and so it's a program that really does help to, to, to boost our economy. Um, here we can see some of the impacts of SNAP um, in, in the farm bill. Um, supports more than 40 million people in the United States. Um, average benefits are from $254 a, a month, um, which is not enough for, for a lot of people, but, but we won't get into that at, at this moment. Um, it's something that's helped to raise um, over 155,000 people out of poverty in New York alone, um, and we're really excited about this program. Um, so the Farm Bill in general, it, it, it tries to approach the whole food system, um, which is part of the reason why it's such a large and complicated piece of legislation. Um, but it deals with food production, distribution, food processing, marketing, um, the actual uh, placement of where things go in the supermarket or in any retailer, uh, the preparation and consumption and the resource and water recovery. Um, so it's uh, it's one of the opportunities I remember in the, the breakout session I was in a, a few minutes ago where we can actually talk to the USDA and maybe the USDA Equity Commission to see how we can correct some some issues or some some select populations that aren't being addressed through other pieces of legislation. Um, we're going to assume by this one and we're going to come back to to this. Um, we at Bread for the World um, really focus on three things in, in this farm bill. One is nutrition. Um, we want to make sure that um, everyone um, in, in, in the world has access to equitable uh, food that uh, can help reduce any form of diet-related disease. Um, two, we're focused on equity. Um, some of these programs, um, uh, like SNAP, for example, is, is, is supports a lot of people in the United States, but it also does not support a lot of people in the United States. Um, so in some states, um, depending on the inclusions, um, there's some bans on ex-incarcerated felons. Puerto Rico, in, as, a, as a territory, doesn't have access to, to SNAP um, and, and a lot of other issues um, that are, are in it. And also, um, I forget the exact bill number, but we do um, some work um, with Act 643, I believe, with, with Native populations. Um, and finally, is, is, is sustainability. We work to try to reduce food waste. Um, um, so one third of the food waste um, in, in the United States, um, of all food purchase in the United States goes to waste. And, and we want to see ways that we can um, help change that both domestically and internationally. Um, I, I know that there's... Um, there's, there's going to be some time later to talk about offerings of letters. Um, so I'll just end it here um, and I'll pass it on to Bob with um, a story of how I got involved in food and, and food security. Um, I, um, when I was, so I'm, I'm 25 years old now, but when I was nine to 11 years old, um, I was uh, uh, a child <laughs> um, and I was living in a middle-class family and um, there was a big emergency um, in my family where my, my father and my mother were both um, not present for, for a year. Um, and me and my brother were left out in the street for, for a week. Um, we um, we uh, did had no way to, to do anything. Uh, we, we were children, you know. Um, thankfully, my grandmother uh, picked me, me and my brother up, um, but she was retired, had no way to, um, uh, you know, support um, us or pay for the food that we that we received. So she... Uh, 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 relied on nutritional government assistance programs um, and government housing assistance to support her and us in our time of need. So thanks to that program, I was able to go to school, um, be able to go to college and able to, to be here today to, to help uh, talk about some of those benefits. Um, and, and I believe later we'll talk about the benefits of storytelling um, as, as we do advocate. But I just wanted to share my story as, as I pass it on to Bob. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Jose. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to join you today, especially alongside the Interfaith Center and Bread for the World. Uh, and I believe, Shanaz, you're going to share this screen, the PowerPoint? I will give me two seconds to just pull it up. No problem. Full screen. 
and then just let me know when I should change slides. Will do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Jose gave his story of how he became interested in food policy and uh, food insecurity work. Uh, I came to food policy after working in the field of uh, public health alcohol policy for about 20 years, culminating uh, in a successful grassroots campaign to remove alcohol advertising from the MTA system in 2018. So that campaign introduced me to the power of faith communities as agents of public health policy change. Uh, helping to inspire me and IPHN co-founder and convener Kelly Moulton, who's also with us here today, uh, to apply this approach to tackle food policy and other public health issues. Next slide, please. Which brings us to the need for policy and structural change around food. Uh, we've heard the term food desert today, and many of you are probably familiar with that concept. A less familiar term and equally big problem is that of food swamps. So areas that have a glut of unhealthy foods uh, like fast foods, junk foods, and sugary beverages. And those conditions are not mutually exclusive, uh, which points to the limitations of these terms. I mean, generally don't think of a desert and a swamp of being in the same place, but food deserts and food swamps can be in the same place. Uh, these terms also suggest that there's something natural about these conditions. And that's why farming activist Karen Washington coined the term food apartheid to highlight the politically driven nature of unhealthy food environments. And another less common term that points to the human made nature of these problems is food brownfields, which uh, talks about areas with a lack of food safety. Next slide, please. And increasingly public health practitioners are using the term ultra processed to describe junk foods and fast foods. In fact, uh, they're even increasingly calling them not just ultra processed foods, but ultra processed products to show that a lot of them really are factory foods, um, meaning they're, they're things you really can't create in your own kitchen, either due to the factory processes that are used or additives and chemicals that are added to it. Next slide, please. And over the last few years, there's really been an explosion of research on the health harms of these products, as we can see here in this list. It's pretty overwhelming. Uh, and we're not talking about isolated studies, but these are systematic reviews and meta-analyses. You know, sometimes we'll see an isolated study that this causes this in the news, and people will get all upset about it. But here we're looking about, uh, we're looking at uh, studies that look across multiple studies to show these epidemiological relationships. Next slide, please. And these ultra processed products, junk foods, fast food, sugary beverages are the very same products that are disproportionately impacting black and brown communities, making this an issue of food justice. And they do this through pathways like higher fast food density in black neighborhoods, and um, targeted marketing to black and brown children and other vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. And these consequences aren't theoretical as we can see here when we look at diabetes rates across communities in New York City uh, in data from the health department. You can see that it's primarily these poor communities and communities of color that are dealing with these high rates of diabetes. And you can also see in this map, uh, when we're looking at uh, poorly controlled diabetes, how many of these communities are, are in the Bronx or central Brooklyn. Next slide, please. So that's all pretty overwhelming, but the good news is there is a growing faith-anchored coalition that's having some success in building healthier food environments. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the passage and signing of the Sweet Truth Act with our community partners in the Center for Science and Public Interest. So this law will require warning labels in New York City chain restaurants for many items with high amounts of added sugars. And specifically, that's items with more than 50 grams 
of added sugars, and that's 12 and a half teaspoons in a single item or combo meal. And that's the recommended USDA daily limit for added sugars being in one item. So those items uh, would have a warning label. Next slide, please. And for that coalition, we were able to engage a mosaic of multi-faith supporters working in tandem with doctors and other public health professionals and community members to be able to do that, uh, as you can see from this list of campaign supporters, uh, and just engaging those communities to come out and see this as an issue of food and social justice. Next slide, please. Uh, I think you might, okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, and moving forward, I wanna bring your attention to some opportunities to support some ongoing public health nutrition policy advocacy. So the first is the Predatory Marketing Prevention Act or PMPA, uh, which helps define and restrict predatory marketing of unhealthy food and beverage aimed at young people. Uh, so this is sponsored in the state Senate uh, by Senator Zelnor Myrie and in the assembly by assembly member Karinas Reyes. It actually passed uh, the um, Senate last year and we wanna get it through the assembly this year. Uh, also at the state level, uh, we have a couple of bills looking at taking the New York City uh, sodium and added sugar warning labels and apply them uh, across the entire state. Uh, and those bills are sponsored by uh, State Senator Gustavo Rivera and also uh, in the assembly by Karinas Reyes. Uh, there's going to be uh, a food additives bill that's going to be reworked. There was one last session and it looks at uh, restricting unhealthy food additives, which have been shown to be uh, harmful to human health, including uh, red dye number three, brominated vegetable oil, titanium dioxide, and others. Um, feel free to email me if you want information about that, and I'll be sharing my email at the end of the presentation. Um, and also at the federal level, uh, the Federal Truth and Labeling Act is due to be introduced next week, I believe. That would require front of package labeling to help people identify retail packaged foods that are high in things like saturated fat, sugars, and sodium, like Canada and Mexico have already instituted uh, and will um, follow up with uh, the ability to sign up uh, for alerts from the Center for Science and Public Interest for that particular uh, bill. Next slide, please. And I would be remiss if I also didn't take this opportunity to uh, share some other advocacy opportunities, including uh, from our friends um, who are working in the Healthy School Meals for All Coalition. Uh, so we're here there are some QR codes for uh, links to action, a click to, a a click to action for state lawmakers and also to sign up for their advocacy day. Um, and you can also email Abby Watts at Community Food Advocates if you want more information. Uh, next slide, please. And then other great organizations working in the food justice realm, please visit their websites and check out what they have to offer in terms of uh, food advocacy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is my contact information. Would love to be in contact uh, with you about these particular campaigns or anything else that you're concerned about with uh, food and nutrition justice. Um, and I, I look forward to questions and comments and hope to see you at Metro Baptist Church this evening. So thank you. Amazing, thank you, Bob. I'm gonna turn it over to Jose one more time um, to kind of explain how we write to our representatives, especially if we wanna pick up one of these bills or laws that you all just presented. Yes. Um, so I, I'm missing quite a few pictures, but um, I didn't have enough space for for all of them. Um, basically, how how we we think of advocacy um, for for any issue, um, 
we really try to build teams um, that care about similar issues um, and get them together in a room. Um, what they do in a room depends, um, you know, congregation to congregation, um, lay leader to lay leader, whatever, whoever we're talking to, we advocacy looks different. Um, one model that we've seen that that that, that works and, and can get uh, congressman's attention is the offering of letters. Um, through Bread for the World, we um, uh, facilitate offerings of letters um, across the country for a number of different issues um, uh, that, that touch on uh, nutrition, equity, and sustainability. Um, happy to connect about any of those issues at, at another time. Um, and we we take the template letters, we, we, we share them with congregations. Congregations are free to include any sort of um, information or e issue that they think is relevant to their community. Um, and we see this as the first step to really getting a community together to engage, to share stories um, similar to, to the story I, I shared earlier um, about my own my own experience and, and really try to engage your members of Congress. Um, many people um, think, you know, question the, the, the effectiveness of, of the offerings of letters. Um, but with the way we see it is the offering of letters, if it's a handwritten story, um, someone in the office will read it. Um, and that's the first way to build a relationship with a member of Congress if you have no prior relationship. Um, once um, you have an offering of letters um, created um, and you have like you were at your church or at any, any or mosque or any center, um, inter interface center, um, we ask that one person collects the, the letters and offers it directly to the or hands it to the member of Congress is district office. Um, this is how the, the relationships gets formed. Once that um, first step um, happens, uh, that's where uh, regional organizers like me step in to try to help in a little more to coordinate meetings between members of Congress and directly uh, with these particular advocacy groups across the country. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is uh, St. Matthew's Church in, in Massachusetts. They um, have a, a very interesting event where they have a bread bake sale uh, um, for Bread for the World, um, and they pair that with an offering of letters campaign. Um, so they, they uh, you know, sell some bread, and then at the end, at the counter, they ask people to share their stories, um, and someone from the members, uh, the representative's office um, in, in uh, Acton, Massachusetts, actually comes by to pick up the letters at the end of the event. Um, here, this is an event, I believe, in... Um, I believe it's uh, Syracuse, New York. I'm forgetting the church at the moment. Um, but what they uh, what they do basically is they uh, at, invite people from across um, different food pantries um, that serve in, um, in in Syracuse, and they ask some of their leaders to uh, uh, some of those leaders to share their stories of why they got involved with the food pantry. And um, these food pantry uh, leaders invite people who are beneficiaries of the food pantries to share experiences of why they, um, they're, they're here. Um, when you go to a food pantry, right, um, it's been my experience, I don't know about everyone else here, you're, you're not going there to, to steal food. You're there because something big happened and, and you're there because you need it. Um, so we, we, we really try to, to share their stories um, and with the most up, utmost respect and confidentiality. Um, and uh, I believe this is the same church in Syracuse um, that, that's doing that same offerings of letters. Um, and, and just to frame the, the whole um, offering of those letters once again, it's very simple to, to write a letter to, to a member of Congress. We even have a, an online form that you can like uh, click and, you know, write your name and just send, send and it'll automatically send your member of Congress. You just have to put your name and your zip code. Um, but we 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 don't we don't think of this as the only step. Um, one of one of the key issues that I heard earlier in the conversations too today is community needs to be involved in these advocacy decisions across the the federal government. So um, this offering of letters is one of the ways that we can engage. But I'm happy. But uh, in Bread for the World, we we facilitate all sorts of different advocacy actions. Um, so happy to, to connect around anything that works for your congregation, your church, your, your lay leader organization, whatever makes sense. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off to, to Shanaz because I know I'm past my time. Now, I think we're 
pretty good on time. Um, yeah, so thank you both for, you know, sharing a bit about the bills on the table right now and what communities in New York can tap into along with some tangible tools. Thank you, Jose, for presenting letters. And I posted a template in the chat that Bread for the World has prepared. And I just want to reemphasize that letters can be used for all types of issues beyond food security work. Um, it really is a tool that can be replicated and used across at a local, regional, national level. So feel free to like you bring this back to your congregation and be creative about the ways you can build community, build power in your community. Um, and also to, you know, support this legislative work alongside grassroots organizing. These things work together and these are tools that are available to each of those buckets of work. Um, now, um, if anyone has questions, I didn't see anything in the chat just yet, but please feel free to ask some questions in our remaining 10 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if there's no questions, I, I just want to say one, one thing. Um, uh, New Yorkers are very fortunate to have a very strong team of, of uh, congressmen and, and senators um, who can advocate. Um, Chuck Schumer is a majority leader. Uh, um, Senator Gillibrand is on the Ag Committee for, for uh, the Senate. Um, and there's a whole bunch of House leaders, um, including Minority Leader Jeffries. Um, so uh, definitely a lot of impact that can be made. Rep and Laura, Lauren, sorry, do you want to come off mute? Sure, thanks. Um, thank you so much for that. And yes, hoping to get that whole slide deck and the letter link I copied. I'm wondering if Jose or Bob have advice or recommendations when we have a direct service oriented committee in uh, or group at our house of worship, um, ways to encourage them to continue the direct service initiatives we're doing all the, the food pantries that so many of us are, are running and pivot toward the advocacy um element people have less training in this um it doesn't take a ton of training but it's like a mind shift <laughs> um so uh obviously i guess bringing these letters to the pantry and having people sign them is one way is that <laughs> but anything else that you recommend we i and i would um, be so bold as to say we are here for your advice. <laughs> um, happy to touch on it, Bob. Um, so uh, we we actually um, are are hosting two things uh, or starting new advocacy actions this coming year. We're launching our new two year campaign around children nutrition, um, and we're hosting one a listening session um, to hear stories about different communities. Um, and really uh, try to just hear a story similar to the one I shared earlier today, if people are comfortable with it, and starting, you know, that collective voice to sh say, this is an issue, this is an invisible issue sometimes that affects all of us. Um, so that's one of the uh, vehicles and actions we, we conduct. Um, and um, then the other one is we, we actually do advocacy trainings. Um, so we we conduct advocacy trainings, um, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, a whole day, um, depending on the congregation and group. So I'm happy to facilitate that if that's helpful. I just want to piggyback a little and just emphasize this point that you've making that you've been making about collecting narratives and centering that. I think that's a really critical point that came out of the workshop I was facilitating about understanding the racial justice component of our food insecurity work and the importance of centering communities and their needs and tracing back their histories and what works for them rather than having outside forces necessarily dictate what our laws and our bills should be. Um, especially when we live in a really industrialized um, food system and we are trying to like be as healthy and you know equitable as possible. So I really love that point and I love how letters can find a way to do that. Um, and I think it's really important, especially as faith leaders and communities being that we have so much trust and access to the community as it exists. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, 
how is that translating on the ground? I'm not exactly sure what that refers to, so I don't want to mispronounce the name, but if you want to come off mute, yeah, and just clarify a little. Ernest, do you want to come off and just clarify, please? Thank you. Or hopefully when she comes back, she can. We'll ask her to clarify in the chat. Any other questions? Um, Hi, hi, it's Henry from the Interfaith Center. Just a very brief comment, um, more than a question, but Jose, I, I love the expression that you've been using, um, offerings of letters. Um, some, I don't know, that, that just struck me because I think usually we think of like letter writing to elected officials as maybe the like simplest and in some ways sort of most superficial form of advocacy. Like, yeah, I'm just gonna send a letter. But to describe it as an offering, I mean, puts it in in faith based terms, but also, you know, makes clear that like when you write a letter, you're sharing something of yourself. Um, so I, I just anyway, thank you for that that term, which I really has struck me. Yeah, thank yes. you for that point. Oh, some congregations actually pray um, on on the letters um, before they send them out too. So. Brilliant way to remind our interfaith work. Um, so I think this is a good place to kind of close out.